Welcome to SciShow Tangents, the lightly competitive science knowledge showcase. I'm your host, Hank Green, and joining me this week, as always, is science expert and Forbes 30 under 30 education luminary, Sari Riley! Ta-da! I've graced you with my presence. (laughs) How long are you going to be under 30 for? Uh, For the next, until May, next May. But I'll be an education luminary forever. That's right. And our resident everyman, Sam Schultz. Hi. I don't have any laurels no. to speak of, do I? I? Hey, I also was n- never a 30. Uh, now, I, if I put me in a list now, they'd may put me in a 50 under 50, possibly a 45 under 45. <laughs> you could do any number under number, I think. Yeah, you can that's just make true. It up. You just have to found a magazine and then you can do whatever you want. That's right. We're going to start the SciShow Tangents 100 under 100. And if you're 101, <laughs> you can suck it. That's just too bad. This isn't a joke. You actually are in the thirty, the Forbes 30 under 30. We were just looking at it. And I would also like everyone to know that when you become a 30 under 30 luminary, they make an NFT and they give it to whoever pays the most. Yeah. <laughs> you don't get it. That's not you yours. Don't get it. It's not for you. <laughs> you don't really get anything. You get the article posted publicly and then you get to look at it along with everyone else who gets to look at it you didn't even know much before anybody else that you were on the list right i did not did you just find out the day at the same time i found out because someone in the the scishow tangents discord said holy (laughs) shit sari you won and i went what you won you won won. (laughs) yeah and then i texted sam and then i texted sylvia uh so sam you were first Wow. I also did get a text. I am sure I wasn't yeah. third, though. I was thinking of buying your NFT, Sari, but then it turned out that I had to own crypto. <laughs> I can only hope your <laughs> NFT goes to a good home, though. I hope somebody somebody out there who listens buys it. Yeah. I If you can get it for, uh, you know, double digits, then that's worth it for the bit and let us know. If it's more than that, please don't. I don't know. $99. If you can get it for $99, that's too much, I think. That's maybe it, a little It's got to be much. like $5. Yeah, like, I think single, single like digits. Like less than a sandwich. Yeah, <laughs> don't bid against each other. The first person who bids, I don't know how it works, but do not yeah. drive this price if up. If we were getting a taste of this action, on the other hand, so then maybe, yeah, yeah, no. but we don't care. That's <laughs> Forbes' <laughs> money. I... I want to know if a single person will have their NFT sold this year. I also want to have been in the room where they were like, we can't do the NFT thing again. Last year, no one bought any of them. And they were like, it's harder actually to not do it. It says there's no offers on any of them, which makes I'm just so like, I don't even know if they're actually for sale. They might just exist, but I don't know. They must be for sale. Well, it's it's only been one day, Sam. You can't count That's out true. that Forbes has an entirely new revolutionary business model on their hands, <laughs> potentially. Yeah, I'll let you know if I get any secret Forbes emails that say, push the NFT, really, you yeah. got to gotta tweet about it, you got to <laughs> post about up. it. We're going out of business. Our, <laughs> my boss is so mad. <laughs> <laughs> we spent all this time and money investing into NFTs, and now we really got to do do a solid for us. And I'll say, no, thank you. That's not the kind of attitude that got me here in the first place. (laughs) Make me a deal. (laughs) Give me a cut. All right. Well, congratulations, Sari. I hope that your newfound luminarosity is brings lots of attention to SciShow Tangents, the best podcast in the world. Yeah, I hope I hope it brings a lot of attention to Tangents, too, because I love making this thing with you all. Yeah. Um, And I. I do think it's the best podcast and it brings me a lot of joy and just, maybe brings a lot of other people a lot of joy. Just don't forget where you came from. Oh, I won't. <laughs> <laughs> Every week here on Tangents, we get together to try to one-up, amaze, and delight each other with science facts while also trying to stay on topic. Our panelists are playing for Glory and for Hank Bucks, which I will be awarding as we play. And at the end of the episode, one of those two will be crowned the winner. Now, as always, we introduce this week's topic with the traditional science poem, this week from Sari. How does one speak of the absence of noise for the stillness and calmness that balanced poise does rupture with the slightest vibration from vocal fold? This poetic narration may be soft and restful to match your mood, but it is not nothing and in fact a prelude to three rowdy voices filling your ear or your house or your car or your biosphere. Noises (laughs) abound from the wind to your breath. Our bodies do gurgle and off-gas in death. 
So loudness <laughs> is relative, but quiet is rare. Those in-between moments, that's the good stuff right there. The topic wow. for the day is quiet, which of course we cannot even try to define. It's just less noise. That's it. There I you mean, go. That, you nailed it. <laughs> there's no scientific <laughs> definition. It's less noise, an absence of noise, or, or Certainly commotion. Certainly not an absence. Because there can never be an absence, right? Oh, yeah. Well, look, well, there can be. I'm sure that there, like, in, oh, in sure. the vacuum of space, it feels like that would be pretty. But, like, but is, is it quiet if there's no noise? Or is quiet a quality of noise? Oh, <sighs> Well, if you were floating in space, you would say it's quiet. So I feel like it's very it quiet. extends all the way to yeah. no noise. It's like a a spectrum, a part of the the auditory spectrum where you're like, yeah, it is very relative though, because you know. Let's do a test. You two are gonna raise your hand when you think I've gotten quiet. Should I not look at Sam? I'll yeah, yeah, yeah. Close I'm your covering, eyes. I'm covering the. Computer. I'll cover you up too. Oh, okay. Everybody, like do it. And then Tuna later will put in a ding noise when Sam raises his hands and a dong noise when Sari raises. <laughs> okay? Okay. okay. Uh... Ding. Dong. You guys have had your hands raised for so long. <laughs> Like, come on, Sam, put it up. <laughs> Great. Yeah, that seemed about right to me. You raised your hands at quite similar times. Uh, Sari okay. raised a little after Sam. I regretted my hand raise when I did it. So I thought that I was going to be able to be way quieter than I was able to be. Uh, it turns out my voice isn't like 100% right now. And I just like lost the ability to make noise at all. You're, I mean, you're a loud guy, kind of, I think. It's it's turned In out general. that way, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, yeah. <laughs> and I'm a bit regrettably, <laughs> and I'm a bit of a I'm a bit of a quiet guy, and I think Sari's right in yeah. the middle. Am I in the so middle? That's, that's why we work so well. Yeah, mm-hmm. Sam like maybe says more, but he says it quieter. This is the first time I've been called not quiet in my entire life, so I'm very happy. This wow, thrilled, <laughs> a really revision to my self image. It's not my first time. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right. Well, now we know what quiet is. It's right when, like, right between when Sarah and Sam raise their hands. Yeah, uh, that's right going to be somewhere. the average quiet. Scientists have at it. We've we've de- de- determined it. Sari, do we know where the word quiet comes from? Because it's adorable. It's been that way its whole time. This is one of the ones where I think we nailed it. <laughs> yeah. So it comes from the the classical Latin quietus. Which is oh, a wow. state that really of. Is <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That sounds like you made it up. <laughs> and from French, and I don't know how you'd say it in French, but it's like quiet with an E on the end. Actually, this is, you. every letter is silent in that word. Oh, yes. <laughs> Very French. <laughs> uh-huh. But it means a state of rest or asleep or inactive. So, mm. like tranquil, kind of. Right. Version yeah, you'll quiet. say like quiet your quiet yourself. Quiet a your quiet arms, little town. Quiet. And then I don't know when yeah. it became probably just morphed around yeah. for from multiple uses from from that sense of rest or inactivity to noise specifically. I love that word. I haven't thought about how lovely a word quiet is before. It makes me want to be quieter. I do hate it when people say that I'm quiet. It makes me actually viscerally angry when someone's like, speak up. I'm like, I'm going to bury you. (laughs) (laughs) So now that we know all about quiet, as much as we're going to learn, it's time to move on to the quiz portion of our show. Today, we're going to be playing a little game of truth and fail. Nature can be pretty noisy, but there are also plenty of quiet moments out there as well. So today... We're going to do a truth or fail that's all about mammals, uh, animals, and their relationship with quiet. I'll be telling you three stories of silence, but only one of them is true. And it's not just mammals. Can I tell you, I saw a TikTok the other day. (laughs) And in this TikTok, one man asks another man, what animal are you least afraid of? And the other guy goes, fish. And the other guy, the first guy says, no, I said animal. And he says, fish. Oh, no. And then he says, no, an animal animal. And look, I get what he means. He's got, he's got, an, uh, we, uh, I get sure. it. Yeah. I think the crazier thing is saying fish, which is <laughs> one, 50% of vertebrates <laughs> and two, a group that includes the great white shark. 
Yeah, there's some really <laughs> scary looking fish, even if they're not actively scary. The great white shark is the scariest animal. You are in its element. You're stuck there. You can move not very well. You have to splash the whole time you're doing it. <laughs> and yeah. it's made of teeth. In this hypothetical question, he said, which animal are you least scared of? Did not say where. If I had to fight it's a true. great white shark in my living room, I'd be at, I'd still be scared because of the sharp teeth and it's large. Maybe thrash in a bit, but right, you right. could just walk out of the room. Yeah. And wait, yeah, wait close it out. the door. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but like, this is a good point. I am not very afraid of fish because I am on land. If I woke up with like a fish laying on me, like like <laughs> yeah. any like a little guppy or something, I would be like, Bleh. so like yeah. a cat, maybe I'm least afraid of. I don't know. Like, what's the thing you could touch and not be like weirded out by? I don't know. This is an interesting question. <laughs> I should have saved it for another episode. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we, do we don't have, have to, time have right to, now. We do have to do the truth or fail now. <laughs> yeah. Okay, next time we're going to talk about what this least okay. scary animal is. I'll think about it. I'll think about it. <laughs> Story number one, though. Coral reefs are very loud. They're filled with the sounds of shrimp and fish and countless other creatures. But even for residents of coral reefs, that noise can become a little much. Scientists found that at the loudest times of day, larval reef fish will bury themselves in pockets of sediment where the sound was at least three times quieter. And this quieter oh. environment seems to be essential for the development of the fish. They got to do their homework. <laughs> <laughs> but that one might be a lie. It could be this one. American bison usually produce a loud bellow at a low frequency, and bulls will actually bellow at each other to instigate challenges. But scientists found that bulls who are quieter actually get more mates and produce more offspring compared to their louder counterparts, potentially because it allows them to get mates and copulate without other bulls finding them and challenging them <laughs> to a fight. <laughs> or it could be story number three. Dolphins use echolocation to hunt in the oceans, producing clicks that reflect off of surfaces and allow them to understand their surroundings better. But sometimes a dolphin just wants to ambush another dolphin. And scientists have oh. found that they will occasionally perform quiet micro clicks whose amplitude is lower frequency compared to the normal clicks. And these micro clicks have only been observed in moments leading up to a dolphin challenging another member of their group. So scientists think that these microclicks are difficult for nearby dolphins to detect and allow them to ambush each other. So uh. it could be larval reef fish burying their head in the sand to get some peace and quiet. Or story number two, quieter bison bulls getting more mates. Or story number three, dolphins quiet their clicks to ambush each other. Do dolphins always need to echolocate is what I'm wondering. Because because if there's maybe if they're somewhere, they're fi like they could just see each other normal and they wouldn't even need to do that. But I don't actually never really thought about how they see otherwise. But I yeah, imagine they, they, can see. they can They can see. But like, you know, they can only see so far underwater. And maybe you want to get your ambush speed going. And you still you got to echolocate a little bit. That seems like a dirty trick, too. Like, it wouldn't count if you beat a, a, your rival by ambushing him first. I don't know. I don't know. That doesn't seem like the dolphins I know. <laughs> ah, you don't know what I know about dolphins. Okay, maybe. maybe The dirty probably. trick. They'll do any any trick. When oh, we write our animal sex book, there's there's going to be a chapter about dolphins and it's not going to be pretty. So they would definitely ambush each other. But yeah, I agree. Once you get close enough to sneak up, would you click at all? Why even Probably bother not. clicking? Sam, do you have bison knowledge as from being from you? <laughs> <From Butte? laughs> do you have like from, a, yeah. like extra yeah. bison <laughs> of part of your elementary school education? My grade school mascot was the bison. So I oh. should have. I should have a lot of knowledge. What did it sound like? It sounded like nothing. It sounded like a flag going woof, 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 on our flag. <laughs> um, okay, but what about when they, that flag wanted to get a mate? This is going to sound stupid. <laughs> I never heard one make a single peep in my life. And I've been in Yellowstone and stuff. Yeah, They aren't mooing or anything like that. And I can't think of like, there's elk calls, which are very distinctive. There's oh, yeah. not a bison call I can think of that people... That, that I've ever heard or, or I know of. So I don't know. I think they're all quiet. I think they're all whispering. They're all low key, you know? Elk certainly do have their whole own way of, like, you'll be out sometimes and you'll be like, who is being murdered right now? <laughs> yeah. Like, no, why that's just there, a horny elk. Why are there dinosaurs now? <laughs> <But no. laughs> 
<laughs> the stupidest noise. You're going to call one to you, Hank. It's going to bust yeah. out the wall. Be that careful. That was the best, the best call I've ever heard in my life. Uh-huh. So uh, by process of elimination, but, I think I know the one I'm going to pick. But You think it's this little fish? It was just like, I just want... I just want if I was a fish, I think I'd Shut up that. for a second. <laughs> Why not? Why not? Yeah. yeah, that fish is scared of all the other fish because they should be. Yeah, <laughs> all fish, fish should be scary. scared of each other. It's horrible down there. Yeah. I want to guess the bison. I feel like it's like an infrasound thing. It's like below the range that we can hear, but they can hear it pretty loud is my guess. Oh, I didn't think of the infrasound. Okay. But I could be totally wrong because I, I have no idea. Because you're what was your mascot of your grade school? My grade school was a bald eagle. Oh, and my, oh me too. <laughs> you know, a classic American uh-huh. elementary mm-hmm. school. And then my high school... Middle school, high school was a phoenix, which is very cool. Wow. Nice. So that isn't helping me with literally no. anything <laughs> in my life. Uh, so, and you're going with the fish, Sam? I'm going with the fish. Well, scientists at one point monitored 325 wild bison in Nebraska oh. during their rutting period, oh. tracking which bulls competed <laughs> with each other and how frequently they found mates to reproduce with. And they also measured how loud their bellows were. And they had expected that louder bellows would correspond to bigger, stronger bulls who would immediately be more successful when it came to producing more offspring. But they actually found the opposite. The quieter bulls were more successful. And when they returned in the spring to track the births of calves and get DNA samples from them, they found that the bulls who had the lowest number of copulations and offspring were at least 50% louder compared to the most successful bulls. This also uh, tracks with my own experience of humans. The loud guys (laughs) uh, at the club do not tend to be, yes. The guys getting in the bar fight, then you're just like, because this, I'm so smooth. I'm like, hey, you want to get out of here? <laughs> Works <laughs> <Yeah>. every time. <laughs> yeah, that's that quiet voice, Sam. Like I've ever talked <laughs> to a stranger in a bar in my entire life. Never, <laughs> never have I. Hey, you want to get out of here? <laughs> yeah, I do not. I cannot no. picture you. <laughs> I just meant I'm Fucking. going to the bathroom. Goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> As for the fish, uh, sound and quiet are very important to directing animals in the ocean toward their appropriate homes. Scientists tested this out by setting up two sound systems underwater, one with reef noise and one that was silent. And then they watched to see what animals were drawn to which sound systems. And they found that animals that tended to be found in reefs, like larval reef fish, were drawn to the reef noise, while animals that were found in open water including many crustaceans, tended to be drawn to the silent sound system. So they are out there listening. As for the dolphins, uh, no. But bats, so hoary bats, will use quiet micro calls or even not use echolocation at all during mating season. Similar to the bison story, scientists think that this might be a way to keep competing bats from tracking each other during mating season. It might also explain why so many bats end up getting killed by wind turbines, even when those wind turbines are using acoustic monitoring to track bat populations, as this might mean people are undercounting bats in the area. So there's actually lots of bats because they're being so quiet. And they're also they're not echolocating, which means they might, they might not notice the wind turbines. So, yeah, you were kind of right, Sam, that uh, that because dolphins, they don't need to use echolocation all the time. But bats do. That adds up. OK. Yeah. Poor guys. All right. Now we're going to take a short break and then it'll be time for the fact off. SciShow Tangents is brought to you by Factor, America's number one ready-to-eat meal delivery service. Life goes real fast these days, and even faster when it's holiday time. You got to work all day, then get home. You got to deck those halls, make Christmas cards, buy presents, write your letter to Santa, build a gingerbread house, and sing carols all evening long, every evening. When could you possibly have time to cook dinner? Well, that's where Factor comes in. Right down the chimney and into your life, to help you skip that trip to the grocery store, skip the chopping, skip the prepping, the cleaning up, while still giving you the flavor and nutrition that you need and deserve. You can choose from Among Factors more than 35 fresh, never frozen meals, heat and eat. They're ready in just about two minutes, which is faster than Santa's sleigh and tastier too. I don't know if you've ever tried to gnaw (laughs) on a wooden sleigh, but not good. Not good. It's magical, but very hard. And (laughs) since it is the holidays, you 
might want to choose one of Factor's Gourmet Plus options with mm-hmm. premium ingredients like broccolini, leeks, and <laughs> truffle butter. Treat yourself this holiday season to broccolini. And for a quick boost of wellness, they have cold-pressed juices, shakes, and smoothies. Hey, I'm mm-hmm. drinking a banana strawberry smoothie right now. And to continue Sam's Wellness Corner with Factor, you can rest assured you're making a sustainable choice. They offset 100% of their delivery emissions and source 100% renewable electricity for their production sites and offices. This December, get Factor and enjoy eating well without the hassle. Simply choose your meals and enjoy fresh, flavor-packed meals delivered to your door, ready in just two minutes, no prep. No mess. They said it's faster than Santa's sleigh. There's no way that Santa's sleigh goes that slow. He has so <laughs> many houses to visit. Head to factormeals.com slash tangents50 and use the code tangents50 to get 50% off. That's code tangents50 at factormeals.com slash tangents50 to get 50% off. Scishow Tangents is brought to you by Parks Project. Hank and I live in Montana, which means that we're near about surrounded on all sides by national parks. You got Yellowstone, you got Glacier, you got the Grand Tetons, Olympic, Badlands, and heck, Sarah, you got Acadia over there too. That's not a, That one's not too shabby, is it? I got the one. <laughs> It's great. I have just recently went there and it was beautiful. So all this is to say, national parks are near and dear to all of our hearts. When I was a kid, I used to go there all the time. We'd snowmobile. We'd look at Old Faithful. It was the funnest thing ever. Yeah, I've, I, I have yet to take my child to a national park, but I would love to take him to Yellowstone. See some real bizarre stuff. It's so weird there. Very strange with different kinds of water. So many different weird yeah. kinds. Parks Project also thinks our parks are great, and what's more, they think we need to be great to our parks and leave them better than we found them. So Parks Project is committed to restoring habitats through education and funding projects in the parks. To date, they've given over $2.5 million to parklands. By supporting them, you join their mission to leave it better than we found it. And there is a way to support them that'll leave you not just feeling good, but looking good, too. You can head to parksproject.us to shop for a bunch of very cool clothing collections, including their fleece pullovers. Sam is wearing one of those right now for all you video viewers. Look at him. Look at it. It does look Look cozy. at me. When you wear that, there does it Rachel is. just like cozy right on in, give you big hugs? Yeah, hugs and smooches. That's what you get when you wear one of these pullovers. <laughs> <laughs> and this is the Yellowstone Geysers Trail high pile fleece. And as a man who loves pullovers, I got to say, this one has it all. It's cozy. It's got pockets. And it's made out of 100% certified recycled polyester Ooh. Sherpa. So this bad boy is perfect for a stroll among the geysers of Yellowstone or for staying at home cozy where there's nary a geyser to be seen. And you can get your own limited edition 100% certified recycled polyester Sherpa fleece. Or you can get t-shirts or sweatshirts or calendars or candles and lots more by checking out the link in the description box. You'll get cool stuff and support Parks Project in giving over $2.5 million to organizations supporting conservation, which is pretty nice. Slice Tangents is brought to you by Rocket Money, a personal finance app that finds and cancels your unwanted subscriptions, monitors your spending, and helps you lower your bills all in one place. There's a chill in the air, which means it's time to stay inside, get cozy, and watch some TV on some of your favorite streaming services. But it's also the season to take a long, hard look at some of the streaming services you've signed up for. Look, you are never going to finish that show that you subscribed to Bing Bong Plus to watch. Nobody finished that show. In fact, everybody hates that show now. And at least you remember that you're paying for Bing Bong Plus. What about all the subscription services that you don't even remember signing up for? Sarah, hit us with some data. (laughs) I got the stats. 80% (laughs) of people have subscriptions that they've forgotten about. And most people think that they're only paying $80 a month for subscriptions when the real number is closer to $200 a month. It is a cold, cold subscription-based world out there. But Rocket Money is here to help. With Rocket Money, you can easily find all the things you're subscribed to, decide what you still want, and cancel the rest with the push of a button. No more long hold times or annoying emails with customer service. Rocket Money does all the work for you. Rocket Money also lets you monitor all your expenses in one place, recommends custom budgets based on your past spending, and they'll even send you notifications when you've reached your spending limits. 
With over 5 million users and counting, Rocket Money has helped save its customers an average of $720 a year and $1 billion in total savings so far. Stop wasting money on things that you don't use. Cancel your unwanted subscriptions and manage your money the easy way by going to rocketmoney.com slash tangents. That's rocketmoney.com slash tangents. Rocketmoney.com slash tangents. Now get ready for the fact off. Our panelists have brought science facts to present in an attempt to blow my mind. And after they have presented their facts, I will judge them and award Hank Bucks any way I see fit. To decide who goes first, though, I have a trivia question. Scientists at the University of Oldenburg in Germany wanted to look at how music production has changed over the years. So they analyzed 300 songs from 1946 to 2020 to see how different the soundtracks are mixed. They picked the top four songs from the Billboard Hot 100 chart for each year and then calculated a value called the LAR, which describes how loud the lead singer is compared to their accompaniment. While the LAR started out at five decibels in 1946, it went down over time, meaning the lead singers are now quieter than they used to be relative to their background music. Hmm. What was the LAR value in 1975? It's a number less than five. Was it called the Billboard Hot 100 in 1946? I can't like, imagine. It's the Hot 100, guys. <laughs> but maybe. I don't Housewives know. They were pretty it. hip back then. Yeah. yeah. Three hmm. is my guess. I have no no basis. I will say people are quieter now. That doesn't, does that just mean everybody's so gentle? I don't know. Uh, 3.5. I, in the meantime, I looked it up, and it was called the Billboard Neato 100 back in the is it, back in the. 40s. Is that true? Possibly the the Billboard Swell 100. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> You're the having Billboard a bit of fun. Radical 100. <laughs> <laughs> Billboard uh, Tubular 100 is good. I like that. That is nice. Yeah. <laughs> the answer was one decibel. The Sari is close. Oh. The LAR what? hit one decibel in 1975 has mostly stayed constant since then. Is it because of like sound mixing? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So like they were able to basically mix uh, to have the vo- vocal still come through while having oh, the music okay. be as loud as possible, I right. think is a, a big part of it. And, and we kind of reached the limit of the possibilities there. Here are the LARs for genres in decreasing order. Uh, so the, the loudest lead singer relative to background to quietest. Can you guess which genre would be on top with the loudest lead singer? Rock? Yeah, no. Because it's the music is loud in rock. It's country. Yeah. I don't yeah. know a damn so, thing. And the, <laughs> I and should let lowest, Sam guess instead. <laughs> the lowest is actually metal music because the music is so dang loud. Mm, yeah. And they're just that makes a lot of sense. It's actually the lead singer is quieter than the background vocals in metal music. It's a neg- hmm. LAR of negative three. So take that, neato 1940s. But that doesn't still mean that Sari gets to go first. So rocket launches are really, really loud. Uh, To try and put them into perspective numerically, the Saturn V rocket used in the Apollo missions was measured to be over 200 decibels, while a jet plane taking off or a loud concert is like 120 decibels, and anything over 80-ish is considered dangerous when it comes to hearing loss. I didn't fully dig into the math behind decibels as a unit, but I tried to. Broadly speaking, there are a (laughs) ratio that conveys the power and amplitude of sound waves, and they're exponential. So every increase of 10 decibels is equal to a 10 times um, in the sound pressure level. So that difference between 120 and 200 is like multiple times over. And from what I understand, the sound from rocket launches largely comes from all the exhaust being shoved outward at a really high velocity, which is what propels the rocket upward and into space. And that makes shockwaves. And vibrations make sound, and sound propagates through vibrations, so it's all intertwined, and powerful vibrations can cause intense damage, as we know from earthquakes and whatnot. So besides being dangerous for any human ears nearby, All these powerful sound waves from rockets can cause damage to the launch pad, to the rocket engines themselves, to the payload, 
and any nearby structures mm. that you generally want intact because they're important for the launch and also super expensive because everything in rocketry and space is very expensive. So basically, since the launch of Sputnik 1 in 1957 by the Soviet Union, there's been research into the acoustics of rocket launches and specifically how to create sound suppression systems to absorb or deflect all this energy, basically making rocket launches much quieter and therefore safer. One threshold I read about was trying to get it down from that 200-ish mark to around 145 decibels, which is basically loud jet plane level. And one of the main sound suppression systems used on launch pads, including the space launch system for the upcoming Artemis missions to the moon, is a whole bunch of water, which I didn't, I'm not like a space guy, so I didn't realize this. Mm -hmm. um, and as of a October 2019 press release, their current space launch system uses 450,000 gallons of water in less than a minute, like shoots it all onto the platform, which is slightly less than one Olympic sized swimming pool worth of water. Whoa. So not that much. It's just it's just it's just one Olympic sized swimming pool. Just one giant pool. For a whole rocket launch. That does seem like <laughs> way, way less than I would have expected. It's a big <laughs> rocket. Yeah. Big rocket, lots of water, very fast water. And the way it works physically is as the super loud rocket sound waves, the super powerful sound waves, all that energy mm -hmm. propagates through the water and encounters like the, the rushing bubbles of air through it. There is a lot of reflection and absorption and scattering physics that goes on to dissipate that energy as other forms like heat um, and really mm -hmm. dampens that sound noise. And those white clouds that come up around the rocket are actually a bunch of steam from this process of like what? dissipating. Right. The, it's like the heat from the engines, but then also from the dissipating sound energy, Whoa. which is like energy is not created or destroyed. So, of course, it has to go somewhere, but it goes to to vaporizing the water. And there are other explored ways of suppressing sound that channel and redirect the exhaust like these fire channels. And maybe this is this is a, a known thing but it was not known to me. And so I was excited to talk about it, that we use a bunch of water to make rockets quiet. It's just like yeah. very wild. Like this is the best thing that we've come up with. We don't use sound foam. <laughs> we don't use anything else. It just throw in a bunch of water. It's, it does the well, trick. Well, yeah. It's like sound foam that like moves around and goes, but then it like dissipates and disappears, which is amazing. Mm -hmm. um, and it isn't like, it's not just the, like it's very loud and that's bad for people and animals ears uh it just it tears things apart and the the mm. spacex heavy okay. launch i don't know if you remember this it like yeah. threw chunks of concrete you know like forever and into the ocean and all over the place and they don't right. use this sound suppression because it's expensive and it instead they the idea i guess is to just rebuild the launch pad every time but yeah it's super cool and the the uh, i mean it's also the added benefit of the giant steam cloud is very cool it looks great classic how do they get water to come out that fast hmm. i think they're big pumps i think they're like on the platform and sticking out from the ground rather than the water being suspended above but yeah i think that's where a lot of the engineering comes from is just like how do we pump it so fast so it's like bubbly it's frothy it can and like the rocket launches so within such a short span of time that you need as much sound absorption pressure absorption right as possible could they build it like on the ocean or something would that work <laughs> i don't know <laughs> or really That's close at least thought, sam mm. yeah. or in it just build it in the ocean it's like yeah sorry sharks watch out here we go get out of here guys no shark yeah. zone then you wouldn't have to you wouldn't have to pump it at all if you just put the rocket on top of the ocean. Exactly. Uh, if you found a way <laughs> to put the rocket right on top of the ocean and then just go. Yeah. NASA, I await my I await the phone call. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Water deluge. Hmm. Water deluge for rocket launches to make it quiet. Sam, what do you got? All right. So crickets might be a weird choice for an episode about quiet because bugs are usually pretty quiet. So just by chirping, crickets have got to be like in the top five loudest of all bugs. But loud and quiet is, as we've mentioned, relative. And today I'd like to talk about the plight of quiet crickets. So qu mm. cricket chirping might be the universal indicator of a quiet, peaceful evening. But to a cricket, that is probably the horniest sound on earth, fraught with sexual <laughs> tension, 
<laughs> because male crickets chirp to attract mates. And generally speaking, the bigger the cricket, the louder the chirp, the easier it is to attract a mate. So it stands to reason that the smaller a cricket is, the quieter it is, and the more it is drowned out by the big, loud Chad crickets. And this tiny quietness <laughs> is actually made worse by a phenomenon called acoustic short-circuiting. I bet Tuna knows what this is exactly, but to my understanding, it is when sound waves coming out of something making noise, in this case, the cricket, meet opposing sound waves on their way out and are canceled. So uh, sort of like a process that makes sound producing things less efficient. And crickets have it extra bad because their two wings seem to cancel out a lot of each other's sound when their sound waves crash into each other in the middle there. And I'm not sure why. But for some reason, this is worse the smaller a cricket is, and it has something to do with the sound wave of the call that they are making. So, as you might conclude, a tiny, quiet cricket is doomed to a lonely, reproductionless life. Uh, And maybe for lots of species of cricket, this is true, but one species of tree cricket found in India has found a way to circumvent both its small quietness and the effects of acoustic short-circuiting with one simple trick that big crickets hate. About 5% of male tree crickets, uh, on average the smallest males, chew a hole in the middle of a leaf, cram their little bodies into the hole, and, and then they start chirping. And now sound is very confusing, but I think what the crickets are doing here is almost but not exactly the same thing that a stereo speaker does. So the leaf is like the flexible diaphragm of a speaker, and the cricket is like the thing in the middle that makes the sound. And the leaf's extra surface amplifies the chirp out through the edges of the leaf, far away from the opposing sound waves of the other wing, Mm. cutting Mm -hmm. down on short-circuiting, ultimately doubling or even tripling the volume of these otherwise quiet crickets. So that's pretty cool. And it seems like a clear-cut example of animal tool use. But that distinction is a little bit more complicated than animals use a thing to do something. There's more science to it than that, I guess. So current research into these crickets is based around determining if they display flexibility or preferences in selecting which leaves to use and when. And it seems like they do. So, so far, tests have showed that crickets are able to pick between several leaves, choosing usually for the largest leaf, and they're real good at finding the center of leaves. They usually do it like in (laughs) one shot. They can figure it out. And they seem to know when it's simply like not even worth trying to make a leaf speaker because all the leaves suck too bad. So I guess the moral of the story is even when you're so tiny and quiet, uh, you can get your hands on an amplifier and talk into it until everybody thinks you're cool. And they love you, making crickets the podcaster of the bug world. <laughs> <laughs> now that cricket is definitely under thirty years old, and it's definitely <laughs> yeah. a, a little media cricket. luminary. <laughs> he can't get his NFT either. Does it have a computer? Oh, I gosh, I might set up a Coinbase for uh, crickets thirty under thirty NFTs. <laughs> <laughs> Just pick thirty crickets that you can find in the world, and those are the yeah. ones that make the list. These are the best ones. <laughs> I found them. <laughs> There's lots of good crickets facts. I think that the crick, the animal that has the largest testicle to body size ratio, is a cricket. Wow, uh, that's amazing. That's just a piece of information that's in my head. I didn't even know that bugs had testicles exactly, I guess. <sighs> Never yeah, thought about g- it. They got to make sperm somehow. I mean, that's true. And the National Geographic article about it says, Cricket has world's biggest testicles, but puny output. So <laughs> <laughs> take that. <laughs> What's it doing with them? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> make that an NFT and smoke it. <laughs> so what do I have to choose from two facts. I've got water-based sound suppression systems for rocket launchers and crickets being the podcasters of the bug world. Sari came into it with the lead, <laughs> but I think that Sam pulled it out. Wow. I did already know about the sound suppression water, but I don't know. Podcasting crickets. I have to get have some kind of reward in this life, don't I? Hasn't Sari gotten <laughs> yeah. enough? Also, Sari's had enough today. <laughs> gotten enough, got enough good news. Yeah. Sam, <laughs> congratulations. Thank Your you. Your crickets are very cool. And you're not under 30, so you weren't even applicable. No, I know. That doesn't make it feel any better at all. <laughs> <laughs> So now it's time to ask the Science Couch, where we've got a listener question for our couch of finely honed scientific minds. At KF10147 on YouTube asks, what was the quietest period in the history of Earth? That's a great question. Snowball? No. Probably there'd be lots of wind. 
I don't know. Sari, what's the quietest time? Nice Have you, I can't. Cracking. I can't. I'm broken. I can't come up with anything. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Geology is weird. Um, so this is the definition of quiet that I guess we didn't really talk about, where in astronomy, um, like a quiet part of a solar cycle is when there's like less sunspots or less activity. Um, okay. Or like it physically. That's not what I mean, but yeah, okay. that's not what I want either. If that's it's what you like- answer, I'm going to be so mad. <laughs> <laughs> physics it's no fluctuations of magnetism i think this lines up though i think i think this is sound wise in as much as i can estimate it so i think that the earth like the all the all the seismic activity that's going on under the earth's surface like the geologic activity of the volcanism everything like that is loud on a seismic level mm-hmm. it's rumbly sure. it's grumbly when the earth yep. formed 4.6 billion years ago Lots of collisions happened. So after the first life, but before multicellular life, um, there's the Paleoproterozoic era, um, which started around 2.5 billion years ago and ended around a billion years later. It was when like the first glaciation events were happening in the in the Earth's history, um, mm-hmm. and it is also when the first supercontinent, which was called Columbia or Nuna, was was in the process of being formed. But before that supercontinent formed, around 2.45 billion years ago, like towards the beginning of the Paleoproterozoic, there was a time when the Earth like took a nap, geologically speaking, which is very weird and interesting. Uh-huh. And I, as far as I can tell, because I'm not a geologist, they like collected a bunch of rock samples and there's very little like preserved record from that period of time, which they are... I think translates to like, we just don't have data about this 250 million years stretch. And there's a gap in the geologic record, which means that there was a gap in the number of volcanoes erupting during this time and the amount of material that was like becoming sedimentary rock and a lull in tectonic plate movement. Um, And it was was like a dormant Mm -hmm. period where Earth's geology just calmed down for a bit like tectonic plates weren't moving as much um there wasn't a lot of volcanic activity and then all that energy according to these geologists that know more than me kind of like build built up in some way and was a shift from ancient style is what they called it plate tectonics to (laughs) modern style plate tectonics which i think um is what led to (laughs) instead of like disparate continents like the su- the first hemispheric supercontinent. So whatever happened during that time, geologically speaking, um, there was like a shift in the way that the continental crust started moving Weird. around. Um, <sighs> and I think it's a controversial. I, I think some some scientists, some geoscientists, are like, well, we just don't have evidence from that period. While others are like, this lack of evidence from the period means that there was no right. activity during this time. And so. I would say this is like what came up when the I was quiet looking time. for quiet. The quiet time this was, was the, the quiet, quiet time. geologically time and probably quiet because there wasn't a lot of life around. Like if you've got single yeah. cellular organisms Damn, and the earth and is kind of calm. Or anything like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They don't make any noise. They're not making yeah, mountains. You're not like, there's no, I don't know. Yeah, there's no, not as many times. volcanoes maybe. Not as many yeah. earthquakes. Earthquakes seem pretty loud to me. And then if we want to fast forward to the Anthropocene, um, the quietest time on recorded record was during the pandemic, which is wild. Oh, so wow. we, and I think it's because we have all these seismometers now. Um, so there was a 76 right. author paper published in July, 2020. Oh, wow. yeah. And there, these seismometers that we have around the world, they, they collected data from 268 monitoring stations, as well as personal seismographs um so like citizen scientists who um contribute their data as well like to this paper and the like seismic noise typically comes from like ocean or like ocean swell etc atmospheric pressure earthquakes things like that but humans are a pretty big source because i don't know we're driving cars we're walking around Mm -hmm. we're commuting we're running our appliances I don't know. We're, there's we're, airplanes. We're, there's trains. Yeah. We're hustling and bustling. We're doing mm-hmm. things. We're bellowing at each other uh, to try mm-hmm. and find a mate. 
And (laughs) when the lockdowns happened, the silence began in like late January in China. And by mid-March, it like spanned the world. And I remember (laughs) as we as we all remember, but the seismic (laughs) noise was reduced up to 50 percent, which is the this is the longest anthropogenic seismic noise reduction in in like the records that we have so far, just because there was such a unified effort to not do things that scientists were able to use this data. And I think are still probably analyzing it to try and tell what is human generated versus what is like small seismic activity that's happening because Mm -hmm. of the earth. Because normally, I don't know, you can't tell if it's a bus driving by versus a very tiny earthquake. Mm -hmm. But with all the people like staying inside, not doing anything, we could use these advanced instruments that we have now to read the earth and understand what the baseline levels are and what, what signals you're looking for, which is like kind of cool. Um, another accidental experiment. Weird. I don't want to do it again. Uh, it was not. I didn't like the quiet. I, I let's rumble our way forward. Yeah, but the whales and the dolphins—they really liked it. That's so. Nature I don't know, is healing. Tend to be said about that because there was dolphins all over the place. You know, they were swimming around New York City and stuff. Remember that? <laughs> I, saw, I saw it on a blog. <laughs> yeah, we could be a little quieter for those guys. I think. Yeah, let's do our best. If you want to ask the Science Couch your questions, you can follow us on Twitter at SciShowTangents or on threads at SciShowTangents, or you can leave us comments on our YouTube videos where we all, uh, these are also video podcasts that you can watch on YouTube. On Twitter and threads, we will share uh, topics for upcoming episodes every week, or you can join us on our SciShowTangents Patreon and ask us on our Discord. Thank you to at Mystic Rookie on Twitter, Corey on Discord, and everybody else who asked us your question for this episode. If you like this show and you want to help us out, it's super easy to do that. First, you can go to patreon.com slash scishowtangents to become a patron, get access to our Discord and our bonus episodes. And also, we got to do that, that Minions commentary, you guys. I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm better. I feel so much better. My body is healed. It's time to look at some piss boys. It's time to learn about the minions. A huge shout out to patron Les Aker for their support. Second, you can leave us a review wherever you listen. That's very helpful and helps us know what you like about the show. And finally, if you want to show your love for SciShow Tangents, just tell people tell about you us. Was. Thank you for joining us. I've been Hank Green. I've been Sari Riley. And I've been Sam Schultz. SciShow Tangents is created by all of us and produced by Jess Stempert. Our associate producer is Eve Schmidt. Our editor Editor is Seth Blixman. Our story editor is Alex Billow. Our social media organizer is Julia Buzz Bazayo. Our editorial assistant is Deboki Chakravarty. Our sound design is by Joseph Tunamedish. Our executive producers are Nicole Sweeney and me, Hank Green. And we could not make any of this, of course, without our patrons on Patreon. Thank you. And remember, the mind is not a vessel to be filled, but a fire to be lighted. One more thing. In September of 2001, two researchers were gathering data from endangered North Atlantic right whales in the Bay of Fundy near the eastern coast of Canada. One was measuring acoustic recordings to study social behaviors, and the other was collecting fecal samples to study things like reproductive and stress hormones. Of course, something else happened in September of 2001, the tragic events of 9-11, which led to a sharp decrease in shipping traffic along the entire North Atlantic coastline. And years later, these researchers realized they had a really unique opportunity to combine their data sets. In February of 2012, they published a study on how underwater noise from large ships affects the stress levels of whales. Compared to the two days before 9-11, there was a six decibel decrease in underwater noise in the two days following, and the post-9-11 whale poop had decreased levels of fecal stress hormones as well. So that is all to say, when the ocean is quieter, right whales are less stressed, at least according to their poop. These poor guys are down there, and it's so loud for them. It is. They just need to stick their heads under the sand. We learned, yeah. we came up with a solution for them. And we say, <laughs> hey, we know you got things to do, but how about you just... Just take a little break. Take a little nap. I'll give you a little kiss on the cheek while hmm. you're down there. So I'll tuck you in. You think anybody's ever kissed a whale on the cheek? Well, must have, right? Yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I think I've seen it happen <laughs> at SeaWorld as a child. Give him a smooch. You're doing a good job. You're doing a good job. <laughs>